So the data has to go to the counting room first. Yeah. Because you cannot sit with your laptop near the particle collision site. Yeah. You will die. Hmm. One silicon wafer can have tens of billions of transistors. What is India's capability today? How many transistors can we indigenously put on a chip? Zero. <laughs> okay. On a commercial scale, zero. It has already happened, I think. There was something going on between IBM and China. Uh -huh. and, uh, because IBM does a lot of hi-fi hi stuff. Hmm. And uh, there was something related to artificial intelligence. Hmm. That um, some spy kind of thing, one country tried to pull on the other country that they will do all these hmm. naughty things with the chip. Welcome to the Abhijit Chowda podcast. My guest today is Dr. Avnish Pandey, who is an assistant professor at IIT Delhi and he specializes in silicon photonics. Please subscribe and enjoy the conversation. Dr. Avnish Pandey, welcome to the podcast. It's so wonderful to have you here. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. So you're a professor at uh, assistant professor at IIT Delhi. Yes. And you specialize in semiconductors? I specialize in silicon photonics, which is silicon the photonics. first word is a semiconductor silicon. Right. Yeah. Yes. All right. So we have a lot to discuss. We'll definitely discuss sem yeah. semiconductors, the research that you do. Yeah. Uh, but I would like to start with your journey. So you obviously are a scientist. You are in love with science. How does one fall in love with science? What was the process that you went through? So for me, it was actually pretty, uh, pretty simple. I was not a very bright kid when I was doing my undergrad. Hmm. But I had this thing that anything is supposed to be mathematical. Like if you have to understand anything, if there is no maths involved, it's kind of boring. Hmm. <laughs> so I didn't study much during initial years of my BTEC. Hmm. But then when I, I still remember when I had to do my BTEC term project. So the professor under whom I wanted to do, he had taken one course on, ele on electromagnetics. Hmm. And in his first class, he said that mathematics is the language of electromagnetics. And from there itself, I, I fell in love with electromagnetics. Hmm. I started uh, doing my research during my undergrad. I published, I think, two, three papers during my undergrad itself. I see. And since then, I'm working in that very same field. Like it has hmm. been, I think, 10, 12 years. And hmm. I'm still working in that very same field. Hmm. I'm working with electromagnetics, which is of course, the light and everything, photonics, which is a part of electromagnetic. But as a kid, how did you get attracted to science? I, as, as a kid, I just want, I just, I used to do very random things. So, mm -hmm. for example, uh, I still remember the, my coaching tutor, mm -hmm. he once gave me a, uh, I don't know what you call that, to hold the test tube. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a tong, something that you use to hold the test tube. Okay. And I think of once once he gave that thing to me, I was holding everything with that. Even <laughs> if I have to drink the glass of water, I will try to hold my glass of water with that. So, so I had been I had been fascinated with a lot of things, uh -huh. but there was no structure to it. Mm -hmm. There was no like the big daddy kind of thing who can tell me that okay, this is the path you have to take or mm. this is what you. I come from a very like a very ancient kind of village from Uttar Pradesh. From Uttar Pradesh. Yes. I see. So, but there there was no. Uh, what you say exposure mm. like somebody who can come and tell you that okay these are the books you need to read mm -hmm. and these are the these are the people you can follow mm. of course no social media so of course uh, yeah yes so you have to re you have to, re to kind of rely on people you are hanging out with right yeah so how did you find the right books obviously you read the right books to study right i uh, know i used to read random books like whatever uh -huh. books i get my hands on like self-motivation books uh -huh. so uh, i think um i think Hindi, Hindi, uh, Hindi Sahitya books like mm -hmm. uh, Dharm Veer Bharti, mm -hmm. Prem Chand, like I some somehow I just knew that I need to read more if I want to do something in my life. I, mm. So whatever I get my hands on, I will just start reading them. My father had a small library, mm. uh, but no science books there. Okay. So I I even read Rahul Sanskritya and all those all those and like like ancient people. Yes, yes. So I I even read, even of course I didn't un understand what I was reading back then, but. But you got this, exposed to that, right? Yeah, I, I just had in, in me that if I want to do something in life, mm. I have to read more. Right. Yeah. No, it is a thirst for knowledge that, that drives you forward, especially in the academic sciences, in yeah. the sciences and all that, right? Yeah, yeah. Right. So, so then how did you, you, you were working at CERN, right? Yeah. So, how did that happen? Yeah. So, uh, after, after my BTEC, so during my BTEC, I had done an internship at IIC Bangalore. Uh-huh. And the campus was so beautiful, beautiful. And the people were so nice, so yeah. intelligent, so like, so like full of science hmm. that there and then I decided that I'm going to do my PhD and I'm going to do it in this institute only. Hmm. I didn't even apply to other institutes. I see. I only applied to IIC. I, see. I, I, I had it in me that uh, if I ever do a PhD in India, hmm. IIC will be the place. So I finally got uh, an offer from there. Hmm. Uh, uh, then I did my PhD on silicon photonics. Okay. Uh, 
so my work was mostly in revolved around taking semiconductor wafers and making some nano structures on them mm -hmm. and after that uh, once i did my phd i moved to belgium uh, it's an uh, to a lab called photonics research for postdoc yeah for my postdoc mm -hmm. it's an associated lab between imec so which is a semiconductor foundry and ghent university so it's a, it's it's a lab shared by both both of these two entities okay. so i did my i did my postdoc there and from there i moved to cern mm -hmm. where i was doing even even more flashy work <laughs> I, i i would say so it's a it's a very fantastic place to be like I, right of course so cern is the place if you are into experimental physics if you are yeah. into high energy physics uh, all that yeah. so when i think of cern i think of the collisions i think of the lhc like large hadron collider obviously they had many other colliders before that yeah. it's it's a place where you do particle physics yeah. so what was your role in that when two particles collide so they yeah. for example lead ions are colliding hmm. and the protons are colliding and they collide at a very huge speed yeah 0.99 something yeah, so, c yeah, yeah. I will give you the accurate number. Ninety-nine point nine 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 one percentage of the speed of light. Of the speed so of light. Yeah, protons are traveling kind of at the speed of light, and when they collide, they generate huge amount. What's of the GeV? I think it was. Uh, it was not GeV. It was TeV. TeV. Thirteen yeah, point something. Thirteen point something. And yeah. Now, uh, so what I was working on. Uh, is because they are now going to increase this TEV mm -hmm. level so the kind of data that they will produce will be even more mm -hmm. so they are going to produce even more data mm -hmm. so the things that they have there they needs to be upgraded mm -hmm. so i was my team was trying to put silicon photonics there mm -hmm. so that it can uh, it can handle the kind of data which is which we need to which we which we need to handle just to give you a, a sense of the data that mm -hmm. we generate there so from 2008 to 2013 and let's see generate generated as much data per day which is more than the combined internet bandwidth of uk us and canada so this is the kind of data we are talking about so mm. electronics won't be able to handle the data for for several reasons mm. so and though, so we need to go for photonics there we mm. need to the links that we need to develop there should be photon photonic based mm. so that was my so right now what they are using it will be it it won't survive the kind of radiation level that this pro, proton collision generate yes so my job was to make sure that the module that we are going to fit there it survives the harsh environment there and we can discuss more about what exactly the harsh harsh environment it is mm -hmm. and also it should be able to manage the kind of data which is generated at the at the particle collision uh, collision site it is the umbrella term is radiation hard electronics mm -hmm. so electronics that can survive radiation harsh environment it's very important yeah yeah With lots of applications yeah for example if you see satellites exactly uh, nuclear yeah military yeah everywhere the kind of electronics you need it should be radiation safe hmm. yeah yeah so for example there was this russian uh, probe to mars that they had launched i think it was called phobos grunt or something mm -hmm. it went into earth orbit and died there it never reached mars because it wasn't radiation hardened the, the chips on the uh, one of the chips or whatever it was it wasn't radiation hardened it, it got killed by cosmic rays yeah so yeah that's, that's why it's really important right the, yeah. what what you were doing yeah. so which uh, specific detector was was your work part of so uh, cern has four detectors yes. so one of them is for example lhcb which is large hadron collider beauty mm -hmm. the other is cms compact mu muon solenoid and mm -hmm. then alice and atlas yeah. so what we do it is actually using all the four experiments all four of them all four because it's a it's a module that takes the data uh -huh. so it takes the data and there is something called counting room okay. so the data has to go to the counting room first yeah. because you cannot sit with your laptop near the particle collision site yes. um, it's you will die hmm. so that's why the data first needs to be transferred to somewhere else so all the from it the things that i was the module that we were developing mm -hmm. there it will be used in all the exp in, in all in all the experiments in all of these detectors yeah in all of the four experiments yes okay yeah. could you describe for the lay audience could you describe what the large hadron collider is and what exactly it's doing and how does it work okay so uh, think of think 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 of a child who has just got a toy and hmm. he wants to understand what exactly is in the toy So what the first thing that he does is Smash. he breaks it yeah he smashes yeah. it on the ground and then the toy then breaks into its constituent parts so at the let's see we are doing kind of same thing but at this time it is more sophisticated so we accelerate photo, uh, protons at humongous speed which i just described it's almost at the speed of light and in opposite direction so uh, around 10 to the power 11 protons are going in one direction and same bunch of protons are going in the other direction 
So 10 raised to 11 protons is how many grams? Uh, could you, could you translate? That, that I will need to check. Yeah, it's, it's a small, very yeah, tiny very, amount. Very, very tiny amount. But yeah. tremendous energies. Tremendous, tremendous. energy. So you've yeah, got so. two, two trains of photons going in different, two bunches of protons going in different directions. Yeah, yeah. And then they're brought together in the collider, yeah. in the co collision chamber. Yes, yes. And then what comes out of that, that's what we want to Yeah, so, so when they collide, hmm. they generate a lot of things like quarks and everything. They break down into their constituent parts. And hopefully something interesting. Yeah, and so... Uh, so for uh, so they are exact, they are, what we study is that once it has broken down into its constituent parts, we study those parts. That yes. what what are things that it has broken down. So into. first of all, how do you record what came out of it? So it is uh, we actually uh, take silicon detectors. Hmm. It's these are electronic detectors that we keep around them. They are like uh, heavy, like tons and tons. They are like very extremely heavy detectors there. Hmm. So I mean, if you if you see, I when when I saw the 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 pipe mm. where protons are actually going. The pipe is actually like this this thin. Mm. But of course, you need to build a lot of detector around it. Exactly. Yeah. So when the particles collide, you have silicon detectors mm. and you can think of them like very high speed camera. Mm. So when the particles collide, they are kind, kind of taking snapshots of the, of the, of the collision. Mm. And then we take this data and then we study it. Mm. That what kind of signals we have got and what could these signals correspond to. So in the past, we used to have things like cloud chambers and ancient uh, you know uh, cloud equipment chamber. cloud chambers wilson cloud chamber uh, so I, so that's that's used in that was used in ancient particle physics like 1960s 70s onwards okay. uh, around that time so today we have silicon detectors detectors in the collision chamber yeah, yeah. first of all the the the, the tube that you spoke about it's yeah. almost perfect vacuum right almost perfect vacuum hmm. the temperature is around 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 absolute zero. Around absolute zero. Minus 271 degrees uh, degree cel uh, Celsius, uh, Celsius. So it is, it, it, it is required so that the magnet, so for example, it's a, it's a circular collider. So you need to kind of make sure that the protons are following the uh, this circular trajectory. They don't bump into the walls. Yeah, so they, they don't bump into the walls. Yeah. Just to just to have some <laughs> one anecdote here. So mm -hmm. in my lab when I was working, we had I think one day full discussion mm -hmm. that if the protons go and collide in the with the with the pipe, what will happen? It, yeah, turns, out, happen? it turns out that it's a very complicated thing. Mm -hmm. If the if the so uh, if the proton if they are not if they are not able to bend the bend the protons properly yeah. so that it it rotates in the in the 27 kilometer long collider mm -hmm. so very interesting things can uh, can can happen and they find it out the unfortunate thing is that you cannot record it in real time because mm -hmm. when the collider is working you are not supposed to be there to take any measurements yes. you have to stay far away it's only when they when the experiments are done in this Try to open the experiments and then they see that okay, something something has happened. What hmm. could have happened? What could have happened? Then they, they go reconstruct. Back. Yeah, so they reconstruct. That, so okay. theoretically, what could what are the things that could happen? So uh, theor theoretically, so because because protons are charged particles, so when they travel in the in the pipe, so they can attract the electrons in the pipe hmm. because they are charged. So electron will feel this charge. Hmm. So when they collide, so they can they can either like uh, cause some scratch. Hmm. That they have seen the scratch, but mm. we are not sure if the scratches they belong to the electrons or something. Something has happened. Okay. Because then you need to do a dedicated study on those scratches. Yes. Which is not right now. Which you is need not a whole intention. new bunch of equipment for that. Yeah, yeah. Which yeah. is not their intention. Also, like of course. they are more worried about Higgs boson and more, yeah. more, more unique physics there. Mm. But it could be a good thing mm. to just study that. Okay, what, what exactly has happened? Mm -hmm. So a lot of things can happen. Right now we don't know what could have happened. But yeah, it was it was one day long discussion. At the end, we finally we finally decided that okay, we don't know. Right. So yeah. in the two thousands, I remember there was this big concern that some scientists, some physicists had raised that the LHC could produce mini black holes, micro black holes, and those could eventually perhaps do something naughty to the planet. Yeah. What happened? Well, did they did they ever produce micro black holes? I'm not sure if they produce micro bla black holes, but this entire thing that something mm. bad will happen. Mm. Yeah, that was complete nonsense. I yeah, 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 total nonsense. Yeah. I yeah. mean, if you if you uh, see the kind of preparation the entire thing goes through before doing a single experiment, these are like extremely expensive ex experiment of also. Course. That's why they have, for example, India is an associate member. So per year we have we pay them some money so that we remain we remain an associate members with with CERN. Yes. And that's the reason that they sometimes that they hire Indians also to work there. Mm -hmm. So it's a win-win situation for both our country and and for them also. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, so with this much money and so much of expertise, I think they they kind of make sure that such such things that entire Earth collapses or something, <laughs> these things don't happen. Right. Uh, they make sure they make sure of it. Hmm. Yeah. So what were the hoped for outcomes 
of the large hadron collider one was obviously discovered in the higgs boson which has happened yeah. what else supersymmetry where is supersymmetry supersymmetry i um, i mean it is one of it's one of the things that they they will see in the future so right now uh, when they uh, accelerate the protons with ion higher higher yeah. energy so the thing is that when you are doing experiment in the frontiers of science sometimes even you don't know what will come out we have no idea yeah yeah so and something is strange so for example if like they had not found the higgs boson maybe they would have thought that okay we need to accelerate the protons to even more uh, and a bigger collider now. Yeah, we need. I mean, there there are proposals. So, of course, there yeah. are proposals. So um, they have this twenty-seven kilometer collider now. Mm, yeah. And they are going to upgrade it. But it is already going on in the the paperwork and everything. I think they are already going on that they are going to increase the circumference to hundred kilometers now. Okay. Yeah. So further into France. Yeah, further into France. Further yes. into yeah. France. So, so CERN is like so. It's half in Switzerland. It's outside the airport, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's half in the Switzerland, half in France. Yeah. So, uh, in the second part of my stay there uh, mm. at, at CERN, I was staying in France. Mm. So it's like every day I'm going to another country. Mm, so yeah. my roaming and everything. It like every day I'm getting message that you are you have traveled to a different country. So, sure, a cool thing to say that I am traveling to a different country for my job every day. Yeah. yeah. So you were staying on the Swiss side of the border, Geneva. So half of time, half of Geneva? my stay, I stayed in Geneva. Hmm. Half of my stay, I stayed on the French side, hmm. yeah, because it was cheaper. So you could. The French say, side is yeah, Geneva. French is, side, uh, Geneva French is. French side, Geneva is crazy. Very expensive. expensive. Yeah, I know. Yes. So I could save some some money while I'm staying at the French side. So, hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you created these. Uh, you were a part of the team that created these detectors. So uh, is that already in place? The no, so it is for the next upgrade. Okay. And I was not working as such with the detectors. Mm. I was working in a module that can take this data mm. and send it to somewhere else, so that those these data can be studied by the experimental by the particle physicist. Mm -hmm. So I was working as an engineer there. Mm -hmm. So it's a, uh, and my job was to just. Make sure that the silicon photonics chip that we are putting there, hmm. it is able to do its job perfectly. Okay. Yeah. So, what does this chip do exactly? The silicon photonics. Yes. Chip. So, uh, so for example, uh, when you have a lot of data, hmm. for example, even when you, in your mobile phone yeah. or laptop, when you have a lot of data, mm -hmm. lot of ones and zeros. Yes. So it becomes very hard for the electronics itself. To transmit this information from place A to place B, I will yeah. give you a, a real life, a real life example where we can feel that what what exactly goes on. For example, when we hear some marriage sound from far away, or when we pass through a bar or something from pub or something, we only hear this thub 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 sound. We never hear the guitars or yeah. the or the. But when we are passing through the marriage hall or when we are passing through the pubs, we hear this guitar sound and all these sounds. So what happens actually? The different frequency goes through different kind of losses. Mm -hmm. So this dub dub, it doesn't go too much, doesn't uh, suffer through too much loss, and mm -hmm. that's why we could hear from far away also. But when we go near to the pub, you can hear all those voices also, like the guitar, like the guitar or the people singing there. So in the electronics also same thing happens there because now we are uh, accumulating so much data mm -hmm. there that if we transmit that data at the same frequency that it is getting generated mm -hmm. with electronics, we calculated it within uh, I think 10 centimeter or so. You will lose all the information. Oh, I see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So just I think with and you have to transmit it to 100 meters. So mm -hmm. you could see that almost nothing. You would be able to trans transmit almost nothing. Right. So that's why what we do is that we first uh, it's called modulation of mm -hmm. data. So you mm -hmm. modulate the data from the electronics domain to photonics domain. Mm -hmm. So it's like putting you on a parachute so that you can go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. You can walk there also, but it's easier if you are on a flight. Then you can go there easily. Mm -hmm. So this is what we do. We take the information in electronics domain, we convert it into another domain, which is photonics domain. Then we transfer the data. So what is photonics? It's light essentially, right? Yes. Light. Yes. So how does it work? It's a good question. How how does it work? So it's like when the light is passing through. So what we do is that we make very small waveguides. These are like nanoscale waveguides, very mm -hmm. small waveguides. Mm -hmm. So then the last light is passing through. What we do is that we take the particle. Collision data or any data, or any, any data. data for that matter. Mm -hmm. Ones and zeros. You ones and zeros. Right. We take we take the, we take this data and because light is passing through silicon, yeah. we make sure that the property of silicon, some property of the silicon changes as a function of one and zero. Okay. Because the property of silicon changes, the light which is going through the silicon, the property of the light also changes. Mm -hmm. So this property, so these ones and zero, these ones and zeros, this is how we imprint these ones and zeros on the light. Are you talking about for polarization of light? Yeah, uh, it could be polar polarization of light. So, but in this time, it could be the phase or the amplitude. Phase. Okay. So, light has like four things: mm. polarization, amplitude, phase, wave vector, all these things. Mm. So, you can change any of these things. Okay. 
uh, to to encode your data and then you need a decoder as well to understand what it means yeah so once hmm. we it has gone to the to the counting room we we de, what we call demodulation we you de demodulate it. It. yeah okay. so we deconvert the information in which was in the light domain hmm. to again in the photonics domain in the electronics domain so you passing the light through silicon yes Okay, I wasn't aware that silicon could transmit light. Yeah, it's luck actually. Okay. So, because all all the all the communication, optical fiber communication, mm. they happen at 1.55 micrometer of wavelength, mm -hmm. and it just turns out the silicon is transparent there. It's transparent. Yeah, it's, tra wavelength. it's transparent there, so okay. it, it suffers minimal 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 loss at 1.55 micrometer. So we got lucky there. So you're creating a, a channel of silicon. Yes. Yes. Is uh, silicon flexible or is it just uh, no no? Rigid? It's it's hard. It's, it's hard. It, it's hard silicon there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's actually the same silicon that we use in our mobile phones. Okay. But instead of doing something electronics with it, we have kind of figured out how to do photonics with it. Okay. So yeah. So, so uh, if you see the entire manufacturing process and everything, they are almost the same for electronics as well as for the for the photonics. Okay, that's very interesting. So you have a channel, a silicon wire essentially, which is yes. rigid and we, it's like as yeah. long as you want. Yeah, we even call it the wire waveguide. The wire? <laughs> yeah. The wire waveguide? Yes, we call it the wire waveguide. One kind of waveguide is wire waveguide. I see, I yeah. see, I see. And it's, it's, you can make it as long as you want? As long, I mean... Uh, I mean, let's say a kilometer? Uh, no, 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 no. It's on the chip. It's on so the you chip. have a chip, so it's like few micrometers long. Maximum millimeters long. Okay, it's maximum millimeters long. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. So you're transmitting these ones and zeros from the collision chamber yeah. to the reading room. Yes. And what's the distance? It's around 100 meters. So you're talking about a, a chip that's uh, millimeters in length. Yeah. So we, we take this chip, the particle data, mm -hmm. this chip converts the particle data to a photonics domain. Then for the 100 meter, we need optical fibers. We use opt op optical fibers after that. Okay. So that yeah. the optical fibers will, the, the fiber will then transmit that encoded data, yes. the modulated data. Yes. In, the, in terms of photons yes. to the counting room, yes. where it's going to be decoded. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Got it. Very, yeah. very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. The the main thing that we have to make we have to ensure is that it is radiation hard. So because yeah. because when protons they are like charged particles, so when mm. they collide with each other, they generate huge amount of random things, X rays, gamma rays, all these things. Even the protons can come and collide with your with yeah. your chip, yeah. so, and they can disturb the fun the functioning of your chip. Mm. So uh, and. It is the same reason that even the satellites, for example, they need to have radiation hard. Yes. So just to set things in perspective so yeah. that we have a, a real life hmm. uh, parallel to it. Hmm. So for example, we have sun and the sun emits a lot of charged particles yeah. because the solar flares and solar storms and everything. Yeah. And these charged particles, they are sometimes, they are the, not sometimes, but when you, it's, a, it's a spherical figure. So um, these charged particles, they are sometimes directed towards Earth. Yeah. And this, because the earth has magnetic fields yeah. and these charged particles are charged, mm. this magnetic field, they take this charged particle to the magnetic poles. And at the magnetic poles, they collide with the oxygen and the nitrogen, and the carbon dioxide. The in colors the are produced. And then we see the aurora borealis. Okay. Of course, we are safe mm. because we have magnetic poles. Yeah. But the satellites out there, they are not safe. They don't have magnetic poles. They don't, yeah. So that's why we need to have this radiation hard thing with, uh, with the satellites also. Mm. So all the big uh, space agencies like ISRO, NASA, mm. ESA. In fact, when I was doing some of my experiment, people beside me were from a European space agency and they were also kind of trying to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They had their own chip mm -hmm. and they were trying to test their chip so that they can be sure that it is radiation hard or not. So how do you radiation harden a chip? So there are uh, different levels of radiation hardness. So for example, I'm working with the hardware so I can ensure that the hardware is uh, radiation hard. Mm -hmm. Then there comes the software level mm -hmm. where you do all these algorithms that even if the hardware at the hardware level, Error correction. Not, yeah. Okay. If, even if the hard le hardware level it is not radiation hard, there let's say there is some glitch, uh -huh. that it could be corrected in the software domain. Okay. So what we do is that so semiconductors they derive their uh, kind of swag because they can be doped. Yeah. And um, when if they are doped, their electronic properties, their photonic properties, all these properties can be managed. They mm. can be engineered with whatever we want, depending on depending upon our need. Mm. So what we do is that first we do the simulations. We do our theory, we solve equations and mm. we see that, okay, if we do this with silicon, if we do this kind of doping with silicon, then maybe it will survive. Mm -hmm. Then you test it out. Then, it te then we test it. Okay. Most of the time it doesn't work, mm. but sometimes we are lucky and then, then uh, those things work. Mm. Once those things work, we try to figure out why it has worked mm. so that we can replicate it in our other designs as well. Mm -hmm. So this is at the, this is at the hardware level. Okay. 
then of course you can never perfect it at the hardware level you can make sure that the probability the probability of 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 disruption mm -hmm. it decreases mm -hmm. but you can never be sure that it has completely gone out because in the space or in the collider you never know what exactly will come out what's going to yeah. appear if you have exact knowledge that when you send out your probe to mars if you have exact knowledge what is going to happen there then maybe you can design your chips in a way that you are very sure but most of us most of our times we are surprised yeah most of our time science all these results they surprise that okay this was also happening there yes yeah. i mean you have the ultra high energy cosmic rays which have really really high yeah, yeah, energies yeah. Yeah. so yeah if, if one of those comes by you, you don't know what's yeah. going to happen i will i will give you two two examples so, uh, also so there was a uh, some anic satellite from Can from a canadian satellite mm -hmm. they sent it out they didn't make sure that it is radiation hard or not it collapsed outside okay and then there was an election going on in belgium uh -huh. and they were using electronic chip and it turns out that the a cosmic particle came and it struck the eighth bit of their of their counting unit okay and it turned out that it flipped the bit from 0 to 1 okay that is strike that is strike it it kind of flipped mm -hmm. the bit from 0 to 1 and then the guy who won he got so much votes that there were not even that many voters there <laughs> and then they later they figured out that okay what has happened and then uh, and then they figured out that one possible reason is that there was some cosmic particle mm -hmm. that has come and it struck our uh, our chip there so they had to repeat their they had to repeat their voting so mm. anything can happen right anything yeah. can happen yeah. so you you do radiation hardening of of these uh, semiconductors of, of yeah. the of the chips yeah. so now let's talk about semiconductors as such because yeah. it's a uh, it's something that uh, is important geopolitically india is now uh, aiming for a big semiconductor yeah. push we're yeah. going to start making our own chips and all that yes so first of all let's talk about what is a semiconductor yeah. i mean earlier we have vacuum tubes for the computers but yeah. then we moved to semiconductors yes. so what is this magical thing semiconductor can you explain like for the non science audience yeah so there are three kind of conductors hmm. one is insulator hmm. one is to that that never almost never conducts electricity for example our clothes our plastic and stuff yeah. then we have conductors like hmm. iron if you touch iron and you touch a switchboard you will see that it conducts yeah like we will very sure we will very quickly figure out that it conducts electricity very quickly at the speed of light yeah and then we have semiconductors hmm. in hindi it is called ardh chalak ardh chalak so, ardh chalak hmm. yeah ku chalak and then conductor is also something but i i, I forgot semiconductors are ardh chalak ardh chalak so it means that we can tune its electronic properties we can tune how much electricity it conducts hmm. via doping so initially uh, so what we can do is that we can have three ports and for example one is source port one is the drain port or one is the input port and the output port mm -hmm. and the conduction between these two ports we can have a third port which can act as a switch a switch if the third port for it's considered like uh, consider it like this you have a pipe with water mm. so and we have a knob between it yeah if we turn off the knob the water won't be able to flow to the other side so yes. it's like you can call it the bit zero mm. if the knob is open the water will flow you it's can call one. it the bit one yeah so the deciding factor here is the knob yeah and the the things that flows is the water hmm. so the knob we call gate this flow of water we call the flow of electricity hmm. and this side and that side like source and drain hmm. so because now we can quantify the flow of water with zeros and ones so which is our switch now mm -hmm. we have our switch now initially they used to have this vacuum tubes and everything where they have anode cathode and the grid in between mm -hmm. and the grid used to act as a gate mm -hmm. it will decide whether the current flows or not yes so now we have the semiconductor that we can make extremely small so we can have billions of zeros and when we can we can have billions of switches hmm. so it can do billions, logic yeah, operations yeah it can do billions of logic operations yes so we can do we can actually process a lot of information there so it what all, yeah, yeah, yeah. so what materials do we use for semiconductors the primary material we use for semiconductors is silicon hmm. but nobody stops us to use just about anything in fact the first transistor that was made it was made out of germanium germanium yeah mm -hmm. it was i think in uh, 1947 when uh, uh, britain and britain they they did the they did the experiment and showed the world that something like this can exist at that time nobody was interested in it <laughs> and now you see it has become an entire geopolitical issue, yes. issue that everyone is interested in it mm. uh, so silicon we use because you can turn sand into silicon and sand plenty out there abundance ab abundance of sand out there yeah. we, we cannot use any sand so we make sure that the sand that we are using it's already uh, kind of has some purity so mm -hmm. that you don't need to process it a lot so there are some um, some sand i think in wisconsin in minnesota or some or somewhere in the us where they they mine the sand from there and then they use it for the for the silicon you know, industry but right now the major material that we use it's silicon silicon yeah, yeah. which is something you get from sand yes right and what is doping uh, doping is uh, 
is like adding new material to the silicon so that you can change its electronic properties. So Called silicon it. as such is not a semiconductor. You no, have to do something to yeah, it. Yeah, it is a semiconductor. But if you have to, if you have to engineer its property depending upon what you need. Uh -huh. Sometimes we will need high doping. Sometimes we will need um, you will need low, uh, low doping. For mm -hmm. example, for if you want to make it radi uh, radiation hard, we figured out that you need a lot of doping. Mm -hmm. But if you have a lot of doping, then it kind of starts to act as a metal also. Then you cannot pass the light through it because light gets absorbed mm -hmm. in the metal. So. There, there is always ifs and ifs and what's there. So you need to kind of um, opti optimize it. You mm -hmm. have to kind of reach a sweet spot there. But the doping is what gives it the, in the 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 what do you call that the things that you use to fight. That it gives it the, the teeth mm -hmm. to do what to, to do whatever it wants to do. So what material do we use for doping? So it's we use for uh, phosphorus. We use boron. Um, so these are the two primary materials we use to dope it. So. One kind of increases the electrons. Mm -hmm. One kind of decreases increases the absence of electrons. Mm -hmm. Kind, it's as such. It's not the absence of electrons. We call it holes. Holes, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, these the these are two things that you can that you can play around and mm -hmm. then you can do whatever you want. Okay. So you take silicon, you melt it, and then you add this uh, the doping material into it. Uh, no. So uh, I will I will give you a, ble a brief mm -hmm. overview how it is done. So mm -hmm. we take sand. Sand, yeah. Then we. Uh, we take the sand through a process. Mm -hmm. It is named after after a Russian. And in my ten years of silicon experience, I have I'm not able to pronounce the name. It's okay. very difficult. Okay. Some clothes son It's called CZ method. Okay, CZ. Yeah, method. CZ method. So we use it. We make the ingots. Mm -hmm. uh, you have. You might have seen this big uh, bricks. Black, huh? Bricks kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So we. It's like cylindrical thing cylindrical. Made, of, made of silicon. Then we dice it okay. to make the silicon wafers. So each wafer is like a dining plate size. Okay. And how thin is it? It's, uh, it depends on the need, mm -hmm. but it could be the entire the entire stack could be few tens of micrometers thick. Okay. Yeah, it's very it's it's very thin. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> we take this wafer mm -hmm. and then we coat it with something called photo re photo re uh, resist. It's okay. a it's a material which is sensitive to light. Mm -hmm. Then we put a mask over it, mm -hmm. and this mask has holes in it, mm -hmm. which defines the device on the on your silicon chip. And then we pass light through this mask. So the light first interacts with the photoresist. Yeah. Then we we develop it just like we develop a photograph. Yeah. We develop it mm -hmm. so that now the photoresist has gone out from the place where you need the silicon to be etched. Okay. And then we go take it through the etching process where we etch the silicon. Mm -hmm. Then we dope the silicon and then it goes through all kind of other um, other processes. And then finally we have our transistor. Then we connect with, with. Then we kind of repeat this entire thing. For because you need to connect it with the metal also because you need to apply electrical signals. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> in all of this stack, so all of these processes, they are kind of very specialized. Only few countries have their their monopoly or oligopoly on over over these over these processes over these tools. For example, this light thing, just one country in the entire photolithography. Photolithography is the yes. EUV photo photo photolithography. It's a Dutch company. It's a Dutch company called ASML. It's yes. a spin out it's spin off from Philips. Hmm. So uh, this is the only company that hmm. can that can create this those uh, machines. Those machines, and there is a reason that they are the only one who can create those machines. If I expire, if I explain you how, <laughs> what is the crazy physics hmm. that goes on into these machines? Uh, it's kind of mind blowing. Mm -hmm. It's I don't think anyone, even if you give them all the equip, all the components to at attach and make that machine, they mm -hmm. won't be able to do it because the machine is so complicated. Okay. And so starting from the silicon wafer, which where Japan has kind of monopoly with the photoresist, which is a chemical, where also Japan kind of has a monopoly. Then mm -hmm. you have mask, where also the Japan kind of has a monopoly there. Then you have this photolithography, where ASML, then the Netherlands. Then mm -hmm. you have. Uh, Etching tools and the plan planarization tools, where America kind of has its own thing going on. Mm -hmm. Then there are tools which are needed for to make these tools. Of course. So then there you have this UK, Germany, all these players uh, playing in. But first you need to design your chip. Of course you need to design it. Yes. Yeah. And there America has kind of its monopoly. There are two companies, Synopsys and Cadence. The the whole kind of monopoly there. There is a third company also, Mentor Graphics, which mm -hmm. is from Germany. Mm -hmm. So you could see that all, all of these are low are very localized. So for example. This uh, etching thing and making the best transistors in, in the world. Mm -hmm. There is a company in Taiwan, TSMC, TSMC. Taiwan mm -hmm. Semiconductors. They do it. Yeah. So they have kind of like if you take the entire um, 
entire foundry business hmm. they are more than 50% i think yes. their business share is more than 50% so they are kind of the best in this mm. field mm. then you have as then you have asml that has like 100 per, 100% of revenue because they are the only one yeah. who can make it so each for each part you have monopoly or duopoly going on mm. and this is what we are actually in india this is what we are trying to do to just get some bits if we can get someone to invest in all this very highly specialized equipment mm. that they we can start doing something of our own mm. then uh, i think it can be a game changer for us so when you were etching yeah. the silicon wafer mm. you were essentially creating a circuit on it right yes mm. yes and so how do you etch it using photolithography machines no photolithography machine is just to make sure that the uh, that the photo re- resist on top of silicon it's open at the places where you need to, where you need to uh, then we pass it through gases through gases so yeah because gases are going to etch the silicon okay so that the gases don't etch the entire silicon you need windows there so that's what the photolithography yeah, machine does yeah that's what the pho- uh, pho- photolithography machine does okay yeah so you etch the silicon and then you put a circuit on top of it then we etch the silicon we dope it hmm. and then we put provide metal connection to it so that you can apply electrical signal because mm-hmm. it's all electronics so that yes. you can apply electrical signals there uh-huh. and then we create a stack of these things a stack, a stack of metal of, okay stack of metal so that you can address all those all those transistors because there are billions of transistors uh-huh. so you need to make sure that all of those transistors could be applied with an electrical signal so mm. uh, that that's why we create layers of metal mm-hmm. on top of silicon okay yeah so one silicon wafer will have how many transistors one silicon wafer can have m- m- tens of billions of transistors Yeah. Right. So that's how s- small the scale is. Yeah, that's how small the scale is. You're so almost at the quantum scale here. Yeah, almost. Right almost. now we are almost at the quantum scale. Okay. So yeah. So it's uh, now to make the transistor even small. So uh, the community is fi- this is, fi- is is figuring out how to do it without kind of ramming into all this quantum mechanical complexity. You're going to have to go quantum computing now. Yeah. So yeah. <laughs> I mean anything can happen so hmm. uh, but right now we are at i think the 5 nanometer or 10 nan- 3 nanometer gate no mm. the we define all this uh, this uh, kind of um, moving forward thing mm. with the node size that mm. it's a 7 nanometer 5 nanometer 3 nanometer so where as, are we right now the the most current node is 3 nanometer okay but as such these nanometers they don't mean anything physically they don't mean anything uh-huh. they are just a marketing term which are used by the companies just to uh, to uh, to tell the to tell us okay. that they have advanced in their nodes for example the 3 nanometer node of intel or 5 nanometer node of intel won't be as won't be exactly same as the 5 nanometer node of tsmc okay so even in that there could be discrepancies mm-hmm. so it's just a name mm-hmm. that we have made we had that what it means is that we have crammed even more transistors we have we have kind of mm, kind of giving you even better performance okay so in the st- sense of performance we have evolved that's what it means but to give us an idea of the scale one transistor is how 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 large is it it's the now it is a 3 3 3d transistor so uh, each the minimum dimension hmm. of it it's like 20 30 nanometer 20 30 nanometer so mm-hmm. just to give you a scale of what is 1 nanometer so for example if i take one of my hair strand if i break it in 100 parts hmm. and each part if i break it again in 1000 parts hmm. then one of those parts is 1 nanometer, one nanometer. Hmm. so these are like extremely small we are working at a very st- extremely small scale mm-hmm. and that's why it is very difficult to make these things mm. so uh, for example photolithography there is a reason that only one company makes it because it's very difficult to make and that's why we have kind of monopoly in almost all these things mm-hmm. yeah so so everything is done typically on one silicon wafer what is the issue with stacking up these things and making a much more powerful machine why is that not possible uh, why why can't you stack multiple silicon wafers on top of each other with with all the etching on it on them So you mean to say that in one go we can process a lot of silicon? No, you process it separately, then you stack it together in one machine. Would that not give better performance, or is there a heat issue there? Like within your mobile phone? Not mobile phone, any any machine. Let's say you have, like you said, a, a, a dinner plate sized mm-hmm. silicon wafer. Mm-hmm. You have done all the processing on it. It's got all the billions of transistors mm-hmm. on it. Mm-hmm. So that essentially is a computer, isn't it? Yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. So what about you take one of these and you put another one on top of it and then you have like a computer that okay, can so run in parallel Okay so 3D stacking yeah 3D it's, stacking. It's, a, it's a it's a thing in pipeline mm-hmm. but I, but uh, this is what the futuristic goals look like mm-hmm. that you can stack more number of transistors on top of each other mm-hmm. right now they, it's not a it's not a reality mm-hmm. because I, if, i mean from intuitive sense it makes it makes yeah. a lot of sense that yeah. if you stack it but when you actually have to do it you run into 
like n number of problems okay so that the your yield might decrease you okay. can run into some uh, some technical issues some uh -huh. physics based issue uh -huh. so there there are reasons that they have not been able to do it but anything is possible in semiconductor anything is possible right because whenever they they uh, whenever they they hit a bottleneck they kind of come up with such crazy ideas to mm. do to kind of mitigate those bottlenecks it's mm. it's absolutely crazy the kind of things that they are capable capable of doing mm -hmm. yeah. so this uh, chip design is done primarily in the us you said right chip design f for some in us mm -hmm. most of them they send their design to india okay yeah so for example all this so there are something called fab companies and fabless companies for example tsmc what it does so for example, you have qualcomm nvidia mm -hmm. so they don't have their own fab they don't make things okay they send it out to other foundries who kind of who have kind of perfected the art of making things okay so nvidia and qualcomm these kind of companies they have perfected the art of designing things mm. so that that suits their purpose okay. then they send it out to tsmc tsmc makes it for them okay now the designing part it depending upon what exactly they are designing uh -huh. they outsource a lot of it to india mm. so in bangalore if you see you have these all these fancy buildings nvidia amd all this big building so they are designing so, chips yeah they are designing chips okay now we want to move ahead of the curve i mean climb the ladder now we mm -hmm. want to not just design the chip we also want to make the chip fabricate the yeah. chips mm -hmm. and in the designing also if you see even though we are designing the chips mm -hmm. the tools that we are using to, to design them they are american owned what are the tools the cadence synopsis and there is a mentor graphics by simons which is a german company so these are the softwares that software packages yeah software packages that we use to, okay. de to design these chips okay and america has all most of them mm -hmm. the, the maximum market share so now we want to i think now we want to move in uh, like we want to make kind of do all of these things in india it will take some time mm -hmm. but i think right now we are in the uh, in, a, in a good direction okay before mm -hmm. i get into that mm -hmm. i hear that it takes a lot of water like really ultra pure water to yes. to process a silicon wafer yes. so why is that so it's called di water it's a deionized water okay. so Uh, I mean, if you drink a lot of it, you might die as well. I'm sure. Because yeah. because uh, the body needs to maintain the iron. Iron, iron yeah. Small bit, nothing will happen. But mm. I think if you drink a lot of them, maybe something bad might happen. So, because you are cleaning the chips with chemicals and everything, and then you need to purge it with water. Mm. And if the water, just now I told you that the scale of things we are working at is twenty thirty nanometer. Yeah. Which is smaller than the size of a uh, uh, this this virus. Uh, that coronavirus uh, yeah coronavirus okay. yeah it is even smaller than the size of a, of that virus mm -hmm. now if your water has all these impurities in it and when you are cleaning your wafer if the water goes and deposit if the impurity goes on deposits on the wafer yeah you are losing millions of dollars there so yeah. we need to ensure that the water is ultra pure ultra pure and that has its own technology mm. to make for example if you are passing the water through a pipe the pipe particles can can themselves can yeah. contaminate the water so mm. they have to make sure that all these things are done in a way that you get the purest water possible it's done in a clean room which is the purest atmosphere mm. where you have almost almost no particle in the no dust right? nothing yeah, no dust no nothing mm. i mean in fact we we have seen it so for example when they show in the shampoo commercials that your hair when you zoom in it has like valleys and peaks uh -huh. we have actually seen them when we do our chip design mm. sometimes some hair will fall on the chip it's not what i have done it's not on a commercial skin but uh, when you do it in a lab when you are doing all these things sometimes your hair might fall on those chips and when you go and check it when you zoom in you could see your hair and then you could if you zoom in even more then you could see those all those valleys and peaks so when i see all this com shampoo commercial and they say that oh your hair is so bad i'm like oh but hair is supposed to be like that it won't be ultra 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 smooth ultra yeah. smooth when of you course. zoom in yeah mm. Right, so ultra pure water is a big component of the entire yes, process. Yes. So to create a semiconductor industry, you need lots of different components. Yes. You need to do if you want to indigenize it, mm. you first of all need the software packages that that you own. Yes. It should be your own intellectual property instead of relying on something yes. that comes from a different country. Yes. country. Yes. Then you need to have your own fabrication, the, your own fabs. Yes. Which you, for that you need ultra pure water. you need the whole uh, photolithography machines yeah. i mean that's uh, something that's uh, right now not possible yeah. you need to be able to uh, process silicon to dope it all that to create these wafers to etch all that yeah so how do you begin where do you begin with all this so uh, i mean you, let's say in the iit you're doing this yeah. what machines do you use and how do you do it 
so at uh, at a, at an academic scale we yeah. won't be able to do it okay you need you need high, dedicated clean rooms for it hmm. to because in uh, so in academia you can create few devices yeah. that work and you can study their physics their performance but yeah. when you have to sell them you have to make sure that the yield and everything they are reliable first reliable, of, first of course. thing and they are cheap yes now all these two things we are not worried in academic life whether yeah. they are reliable or whether they are cheap we mm. do our experiments yes but on an industrial scale then you need very sophisticated equipment mm. for example eu lithography one machine costs around 800 to 1600 crores okay so you could i mean in academic labs the entire i think the entire university labs are made of 800 crore rupees of course so you, we cannot do it on in on, in in our own academic labs mm-hmm. but if you have to set it you need yes you need a lot of money you need a lot of huge amount of investment huge, a huge amount of investment and in fact india had one pro- such program we had such one such unit okay it's called scl semi uh, semiconductor complex limited it was in mohali okay it was around 1985 85 1985 yeah so what, so, so hmm. i i will just put things things in perspective so, so when the fairchild the first big company in this in this entire thing the fairchild semiconductors with george moore and bob noyes found it was the precursor of intel then they left the fairchild and founded intel so <clears throat> when they started to uh, outsource their semiconductor manufacturing they came to india in 1960s but then they saw us and they realized that the kind of system that we have built for businesses around in in india they were very surprised so they left so very business unfriendly yeah so mm. they went to malaysia and hong kong that's why you see they still have very uh, healthy semiconductor ecosystem in malaysia hong kong these places so they first came to india yeah yeah they first came to india okay the very first was india i'm not sure but before going to malaysia for sure they came to india also. i see i yeah, see yeah. Mm. so we chased them away we chased them away uh, wonderful at that time at that time i mean we hear all these things that our that time leaders were visionary you could see how visionary they were certainly yeah yeah yes magnificent so, leaders yeah mm. and uh, then they uh, then then a lot of time they kept approaching us okay we kept we kept pushing them we away kept pushing them away mm. but finally we had uh, one such chance so they, we opened a semiconductor complex limited in mohali i see and at that time it was one of the most advanced manufacturing um, uh, this manufacturing lab there so that time the most advanced node was 800 nanometer i think and we were making one micrometer node there okay but there was a fire in the in the entire in the entire company I now see. there are conspiracy theories around I that see. whether where there are hands involved there mm. or whether it was it was natural so i won't go into that i don't even know what okay, what, yeah. what was that mm. so <clears throat> so the thing was destroyed that thing was destroyed and then we tried to resurrect it but resurrecting a semiconductor conductor lab is not the same as opening a general store that you can just decide and it then and it will happen mm. it needs a lot of concentration from from the from the entire hierarchy mm. it needs it's need they need to feel that it is very important that's only way it can happen which i think we are doing now which is what's happening now which today. is what is happening now i think yeah, that yeah, yeah. now i see that now i think i mean whenever i listen to even foreign experts then use our name even though we are not we are nowhere in the entire business but at least they have sensed it that we are very sure now we are very uh, serious now yes so then the then the entire thing was burned down and after that also they kept approaching us the foreign companies sometimes they will approach us we had some programs here and there but what we were able to manage finally is the design hub in bangalore mm-hmm. more than that we don't have anything so let's talk about intel yeah how, when did intel begin and how what's the, the journey been like Okay, uh, it has a fantastic history to it. Mm-hmm. So Shockley invented. We uh, we remember the Shockley invented. Forty seven. Yeah, forty seven. Yeah. yeah, he invented the he invented the tr- uh, the transistor. Now what yeah. actually happened is that he had the idea of mm-hmm. transistor. He tried to do the experiments, but the experiments never worked out. Mm-hmm. So at that time, the Bell Labs was owned by AT and T, I think. Mm-hmm. So they hired Bredain and Bredain two two scientists. In fact, I think Bredain won Nobel Prize two times. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> so they hired them. They did the experiment, and the experiment worked. Mm-hmm. now shockley was very shocked that i was not able to do it but they had been he didn't want to share the fame the name and the fame and everything so what he did is that he went back to his lab and he decided that i will design n number n types of uh, transistors now like whatever configuration you can think of and i won't make my name just in academia i wouldn't be a business tycoon as well okay he opened a company called shockley semiconductors limited okay but shockley was an ignorant guy i mean the people So, I I was reading one Stanford archive and they had written that he could see electrons zipping through in the transistor but he could not see the people working around him he mm. was so mm. like he he was an ignorant guy so he opened this Shockley semiconductor lab 
Then eight people left that lab. They, they, they are called the traitorous eight. Okay. And Bob Nice and George Moore, uh -huh. Go uh, Gordon Moore, there were two of them. Okay. They founded Fairchild Semiconductors. Okay. Which actually came to India to set up their thing, but we chased them away. I see. I see. Then Fairchild Semiconductor, it got a lot of funding because that time all this Russian Sputnik thing was mm, going on. Yes. And they had their own space mission, mm -hmm. Apollo and everything. Yes. We, some war was also going on. I'm not sure. I'm mm. not an expert in that, so I'm, I won't take any name. That's all right. I can be wrong there. So that's why they were trying to do something. The government said that do anything, I will give you whatever money you want. Just give me something that can work for my army and for my space mission. Hmm. So Fairchild and Texas Instrument were two big companies that Texas time. Texas Instrument, yeah. yes. Hmm. So they were trying to do it. But then finally, because of some fin financial uh, uh, thing that they were not some, some share bonus or something. Then two people left there again, Bob Noyes and Gordon Moore. And they founded Intel then. Intel. So this is the history so of Intel. What year is this? Roughly, roughly, I think it was in 1960s. 60s, okay, yeah, 60s. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. Intel was founded in, founded in the 60s. Yeah, I think it was. I'm not sure, like 1963 or something. Somewhere around that time. And mm -hmm. all eight of them, the traitorous eight. Mm -hmm. uh, one, I think, uh, all eight of them were like extremely talented. Mm -hmm. They went on to do very superbly fantastic things. Okay. Yeah, and he was not happy. Shockley was not happy uh -huh. that they had they, that they left him. And eventually, he had, to, he had to shut down his shop. He okay. had to shut down the company. So, he was not good at business. Yeah, he was not good in business. After mm. that, he I think he went back to academia. Okay. And then the other guy with whom he was, he shared the Nobel Prize, Bratain or Bratain, he did uh, super uh, conducting magnets and he won a Nobel Prize in that as well. So, they won two Nobel Prizes. Yeah. Okay. So, so, Intel is founded sometime in the 1960s. At, at that time, what was the level of... Uh, Capability that semiconductors had. I mean, the first transistor commercial had only four transistors. Four transistors. Four, 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 what four. year was this roughly? 50s? Same, same thing. 55, 50, 60s. Okay, thing. okay. Just the four transistors. Thing, yeah. And then this, what we call the Gooden, uh, the Moore's law. Moore's law. Every, every, at first, it was like every year, the number of chips on a chip, on, on the number of transistors on a chip will double and the performance will double and the cost will reduce to its mm -hmm. half. So, for the 10 years, it followed the same trend, mm -hmm. but then he revised his law and he said that every two years now. Okay. So, that's what we call the Moore's law, that every two years, the number of transistors on a chip will keep on doubling. Okay. And what is the size of a chip? That, that uh, dinner plate size thing, right? Yeah, the, the, that's the entire wafer. Okay, so, we dye, dye the chips. Okay. So, it's like mithai size. Okay, mithai size. One chip was like mithai size. I see. Yeah. Okay, okay. So, when we when we open our... Uh, we have a chip in the, the we should CPU. Not, yeah, we should not open our mobiles, ah. but if you yeah. open, you will see that black thing. Yeah. But the inside that black thing, uh, you have your silicon chips. So, that yeah. is the chip that you're talking about, a CPU or a GPU? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that chip. It's a microprocessor. A microprocessor. Yeah, yeah. So that's in the 1960s that it, it, it all begins with four transistors on a single chip. Yeah. And then every year for a while it was double, doubled. Yeah. And then eventually every two years it's doubling. Yeah, yeah. So then we can actually calculate how much it will be today. Yeah. So where, what is India's capacity to, capability today? How many transistors can we indigenously put on a chip? Roughly, I mean. Zero. <laughs> okay. On a commercial scale, zero. Hmm. In a lab, we, we have been able to do it. Hmm. I mean, I have done it in my lab. But if you want to do it commercially, hmm. I think zero. That that we can hmm. that we can make and we can sell. Hmm. So that's, I think, is zero. Okay. But if a couple of scientists were to get together and try something, I'm sure they could put a few transistors on it. Yeah, yeah, you could hmm. put a few. I have done it. You, okay. I mean, if you're working in a lab, uh, hmm. you, 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 you can do it. Hmm. Um, but uh, to do it on a commercial scale, it's something. So essentially, we're starting from scratch right now. But if we were to get an investment and have other companies come to India and set up their fabs over here, yeah. then we have the ready-made capability through other companies, right? So if we ask TSMC to open a, open a plant over here, yeah. I mean, if, we, if they are willing to do it, then the entire setup is av available here. But then the qu question is, how do we get the know-how? Yeah, so yeah. Uh, yeah, a lot of these things, hmm. they have what we call gen generational knowledge. Hmm. So Yeah, generational knowledge. Yeah, so even if, when they come, we all this IP transfers and all these things happen, we have to invite their experts. Yeah. China did that. Japan did that. They invited, uh, so, uh, so <clears throat> how TSMC was found. Hmm. So I told you that Texas Instrument was also a player at that time. Mm -hmm. So Morris Chang was uh, the key player in Texas Instrument. Mm -hmm. And at the end, they didn't give him the CEO position. Okay. And then Taiwan kind of realized that they are in trouble because of all this geopolitical thing yes. happening. So they invited Morris Chang mm. that please set up a big semiconductor ecosystem for us. And he did that. Okay. Because he had so many connections. He was kind of this like just one level below the CEO of Texas Instruments. So uh -huh. he 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 knew people in the in the in the field. Mm. So he went there and he and then he established 
the entire system and today if you see they are the leaders mm. yeah it happened i think it happened in this way for all for all the countries for japan also for Jap for japan also um, for example in japan in japan they took it to next level see everyone was stealing us patents of course yeah because the, it's such a complicated thing that if you start to develop on your own it's going to take too long it will take too long yeah so japan that time it was stealing it mm -hmm. i mean of course they were very smart also they did a lot of things on their own china we know that how they china has stolen everything yeah so it is also still is stealing thing but the support from the government the vision from the government yes. was completely different Aikida in 1965, 1965 he was the he was the president or prime minister whatever they call in Japan mm -hmm. he went for a trip in France he took the sony transistor with him mm -hmm. and he gifted it to the France chair prime minister mm -hmm. and the France prime minister called him the radio salesman but this was their vision that yes. the entire the entire from the politicians to the bureau to the bureaucracy to the scientists they were all working towards a common goal that i will all aligned, that yeah. we will do whatever you want to do mm -hmm. in india i mean we take businesses we kind of use at an abusive terms that mm. he is uh, he is under his pocket or he is under he is under him his pocket we don't use name of big businessman mm. with respect with respect yeah, that's the unfortunate yeah. situation yeah. Yeah. but with them they 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 were very they were very, they helped their businessmen mm. in whatever way possible mm -hmm. and um, from china also i remember that uh, reading somewhere that one they were traveling to africa and their vice premier i am not sure what is the equivalent of vice premier in india their vice premier traveled with huawei mm -hmm. the semiconductor company the 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 mobile company yes. to make sure that they can put some influence in african countries mm -hmm. so this is the this is the level they maintain yes and we use them as like abuse like we abuse our businessmen yeah that's the unfortunate uh, yeah. reality of india until i mean even now all people do that yeah but at least in the last few years we seem to have a pro proper national vision where we want to be in 10 20 years yeah. and we are working towards that and and uh, yeah so hopefully we will get on the right track and maybe so let's say we we start all this right now mm -hmm. I'm mean, not starting from four transistors on a chip, but yeah. we invest investments and we invite investments and set up things over here. It could take ten, twenty years for us to become a mature semiconductor uh, uh, ecosystem, right? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. It, mm, not less than that. Not less than twenty. It's years. not going to happen tomorrow. It's, it's not, not going to happen. Not, yeah, next as week. I said, it's not like setting up a mid-high. Yeah. Um, with Kidukan, that you can just set it up. It's it's hmm. very complicated thing. It's very complicated, of course. Yeah. Anyway, at least we have woken up. At least we are doing something. I am yeah. sure we could have done if if we started in the eighties, like you said, it would have been a whole different story today. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, okay. We we cannot uh, rue past opportunities, uh, spilled milk, and all that. Yeah. I think uh, we have good leaders. We have a good leadership. We we are looking in the right direction. Hopefully, in the next twenty years, we we become a major force in this. Yeah, I yeah. hope so. And yeah. once we do that, what what we don't realize is it's not it's not just um customer based things that will get improved mm -hmm. for example it's not just that we will start making our own mobile phone and laptops yeah if you see the space mission mm. if you see our military mm -hmm. now they have to import all the semiconductor chips from somewhere else and what, in fact we don't know what comes in there yeah and in fact pentagon had that problem mm. and he, he, when the um, american companies like they like it decided that okay we are sending our chips to tsmc hmm. but the designs that they are using there is always a possibility that someone can steal it yeah so pentagon decided that we will have our own semiconductor thing but it's so complicated even they were not able to do it hmm. so it just tells you how complicated these things are and one but to be completely self reliant hmm. and to be absolutely nothing hmm. there is a big space between these two hmm. so i am what i am saying is that it's bad not to be at absolute zero even if we are able to do something it will it is it is already good yeah so that we can at least support our space mis space mission we can Military. support our army yeah, yeah. so uh, it becomes then security is you know security issue and everything and then if we are self land in that then it is going to help almost everyone can you tell me what a back door is the back door is uh, so one thing that we could use to our advantage which is non technical in nature is our foreign policy mm -hmm. that most of the things that has that have happened with these with these countries like japan and china and korea korea has samsung which is also one of the top industry it because they they used all this geopolitics thing that uh, if two countries are going through a tussle mm -hmm. india can present itself as a lucrative alternative 
that both of you come and then and invest in India and we will provide you with everything, which is what I think we are doing now. So this can accelerate things. But at the end, these companies actually they are very powerful companies. They take the final decision. The governments don't interfere with them a lot. So what what we can do is that we can always keep pitching to them that we are one of the fine candidates. Please come and invest in our country, which is what I think we are doing now. That that can accelerate the process, but nothing can. I don't think there exists a backdoor that you can go and you can exploit it. No, what I meant yeah. by a backdoor is on a chip, mm -hmm. on a chip, on a computer chip. We know what the design is and all, but there could be something in there mm -hmm. that has been placed by the manufacturer that we are not aware of, right? Which could uh, for example, if I have an iPhone, mm -hmm. it's possible that somebody or some power, world mm -hmm. power, could be spying on it, could be siphoning off my data and uh, be being aware of whatever I'm doing without my knowledge. And you can embed such such capabilities on chips, right? Yes, those things could be done. And mm. I am not sure, but I think it has already happened. I think there was something going on between IBM and China, uh -huh. and uh, because IBM does a lot of high hi-fi stuff, hmm. and uh, there was something related to artificial intelligence hmm. that um, some spy kind of thing. Uh, one country tried to pull on the other country that they will do all these hmm. naughty things with the chip. What at this scale? What actually happens? It never comes. The reality never comes out. That yeah. What exactly has happened? Absolutely. But there are news that yes, these things can happen, hmm. and I think that's how they happen. Hmm. If somebody has to spy on you, he uh, very highly unlikely he will come inside your home and you set up his to. things. Yeah. No need to. He can just put something in your mobile phone, yeah. which is which you are try, which you are yeah. carrying with you every day, and he can just listen to it. So people think of uh, software viruses, yeah. but there can be a virus that's even deeper than that, which is in in the functionality of the of the microchip itself. Of the microprocessor yeah, itself, and yeah. which you are not aware of at all. Yeah. So that can happen. I mean, that's the power of, of having your own fab, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's the, the that's the that's the major advantage. Mm. Nobody can do. Nobody can be completely self-reliant. Mm. Right now, it is so difficult to make yeah. all the components yeah. that nobody can be completely self-reliant. Mm. But at least you can make sure that you are not zero. Also. The thing. Can, is, yeah. yeah. The thing is this: if we look at the global geopolitical chessboard. The U.S. is the major power, of course, we know that. Now, Western Europe is entirely under the U.S.'s domination. Okay, after the Second World War, the Europe was divided into two blocks. One was the Eastern Bloc, which was under the U.S.S.R., and the other was the Western Bloc, which was essentially under U.S. occupation. Germany is still under U.S. occupation. Ah. Italy is still under U.S. occupation. NATO essentially is controlled and run by the U.S. Seriously? So, yeah, so Western Europe essentially is owned by the U.S. So, if Netherlands has TS has ASMC ASML. Yeah, it's America. It's America that owns it. When we talk about Japan, the Americans have more than 130 permanent U.S. military bases on Japanese soil. The Japan is not a free country. It's under U.S. military occupation. So everything they produce is actually owned by the U.S. Once again, when we talk about Taiwan, it's a military fortress of the U.S. in the, in the right next to China. And if TSMC is doing all this again, it's owned by the U.S. So the U.S. has offshored lots of these things to its own. To the countries it to the countries it controls. So essentially, all of this is owned by the US. That's the thing. The Chinese are trying to set up a parallel system okay. through their own thing. The Russians, I don't know where they are, and we are essentially starting from scratch. So essentially, we have to understand. Even though Japan owns one piece of this thing, the Dutch own the photolithography machine technology. It's all actually controlled by the US. So that is the power of being a superpower. Yeah. When when I was in Belgium, I had a friend there, and he used to say that it's kind of an open secret here that mm. Americans have nukes and everything here. We we keep their oh yeah. yeah yeah. But he said that nobody talks about it. And of course, at that time, I was not at all interested whether America mm. has nukes in your country or not. So yeah. I didn't I didn't prod more into it. But uh, yeah, I mean it 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 can be possible, not just from the from the military side uh, point of view. For example, the tool that ASML makes, the mm. EUV lithography. Mm. The most important parts of that of the tool, hmm. they are made in US. Well, there you go. Yeah. Hmm. So US has like, and that's how they arm twist. For right now, ASML cannot sell its high, the EUV machines to China. Hmm. Nvidia cannot sell its AI, the most advanced AI chips designs to China. And uh, and then the cadence and synopsis, the their uh, so because they 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 design the chips, hmm. but the most advanced advanced design tools mm -hmm. they cannot ship they cannot give uh, give to china mm. they try to do something to mitigate all these things 
the, the I mean the the Chinese. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that's the that's the written thing that mm. they cannot sell. And this is the reason that we, because we have ownership of some of the tools that you are using in your machine. Yes. So we can arm arm twist you. Absolutely. Yeah. Right. So right now we are going through the very beginning, the very infancy of the AI revolution. Yeah. What suddenly brought this about? I mean, why could we not have AI twenty years ago? It's semiconductors. Semiconductors. Yeah. yeah please explain. Yeah. So not just in AI. Mm. If you see the automobile, mm. they are now talking about software-defined vehicles. Mm. And all this, um, for example, Tesla and all that self-driving cars, yes. and electronic charging machines, and all those things. Yeah, it's because now that we can put a lot of sem- uh, se- uh, a lot of semiconductors in the chip, it the processing power increases, mm. and some of the algorithms for AI and uh, and other things they were so complicated to actually carry out with the hardware that we had that it halted their progress. Right. But now they can. Now, because uh, because they can do do it with so much of transistors, mm-hmm. so as you see, that Chat GPT has come out yeah. and all this Nvidia thing has is is coming out. Tesla has now going to, it's now actually designing its own semiconductor chips, which mm. unheard of in automobiles. Okay, that an automobile company is designing semiconductor chips. Mm. It's unheard of. Yes, Apple used to do it for for it. So that's why uh, we have very good connectivity between Apple. All the the yeah, ecosystem. All, yeah. yeah, because the design. Some of the important things in their mobile phone and the laptops and mm. the ear, ear, and the AirPods yeah. on their own. Mm. So now I think going forward, semiconductor is going to be a huge thing in almost all these uh, all these areas. Mm. Silicon photonics is also one of the thrust areas mm. in the in our uh, semicon also the semi semiconductor mission also mm. it's there the name is there silicon, silicon photonics silicon photonics mm. and Intel and, and and Nvidia they already have incorporated silicon photonics modules in mm. their in their transceivers in mm. the, some of the things that they sell they have already incorporated. Certain as I told you, even the physics people they are now moving towards uh, silicon photonic based things. Uh-huh. So going forward, this industry is also going to take off. The entire semiconductor in- industry is going. I mean, it has already taken off, but the silicon photonics thing will also take off. Mm-hmm. So huge amount of possibilities out there. Mm. We just have to grab it. This time we should not let it. Absolutely. Yeah, let it go. We're just like we kind of had with almost all the revolutions in the past. Mm. You said that, that Nvidia etc. They have these. Uh, uh, these uh, offices, whatever in Bangalore, and they're yeah. designing chips. What are the skills that it takes that you need to become a chip designer? You, uh, I'm not sure what exact what kind of things that they need, especially. Mm-hmm. But you need to have an in-depth understanding of how these transistors are connected to yes. each other. Mm-hmm. Some computer science knowledge, because when you have connected billions of transistors, you should know how the routing and everything can be done mm-hmm. in a, in the most efficient manner. So yes. you should be able to do that. You should, if you understand all the semiconductor physics, it's, physics a, plus, is it's, a, point, yeah. it's a plus point because mm. then you kind of know what you are doing. Yes. Uh, so yeah, if you want to be a designer, these things you should be you, you should be knowing. I think the reason I asked you this is because of, it depends on the quality of the education system as well, right? You need yeah. to have a really good education system to produce the right kind of people that can take take this all all of this forward. Yeah. Uh, what is your opinion about the education system that we have today? I mean, overall, from the perspective of research that has real world importance, real world impact. See, I think some of our top universities they do they do actually pr- pretty good work, but the problem is that the students who do that kind of high quality work mm. they move out, they move out of India. There has to be a reason why they move out. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, in my exp- in my own experience, for example, in Europe the salary is not that great. Mm. If you even if you don't do PPP conversion, mm. purchasing yeah. purchasing power parity can this. If you just do direct conversion between euro and I have friends in India who were earning more than me when I was in Europe. Mm-hmm. So I think they don't move out for the money. It's one of the reasons, of course. So what do they move out for? They move out, I think, for the quality of life. That's one. Yeah. And opportunities. Opportunities. I think opportunities will come if you have if you can retain your talents. Yeah. Then companies will come yeah. because then they will find. A, for example, they went to Israel. Mm. Intel has a very big fab in Israel, mm. and Israel, as such, compared to Europe and US, it is not not known for its quality. As such quality of life, mm. but they have they they are able to retain their talent. Mm. So this company will go there. Right now, with us, the problem is I mean all the top students they move out, and even the developed economic economies they make sure that when the top ta- when the top talents are coming out, then they have all these policies that can retain them. I remember when I was in seventh eighth class, brain drain used to be a thing with negative connotation. Mm. Now we celebrate it. That this guy has become CEO there. I mean, more power, more power to them. They should be able to do whatever they want. 
But I don't know why we are. Why so, are we celebrating that? Yeah. I mean, why what we do we are get, celebrating that? Yeah. What do we get from it? So I will I will give you an example. Hmm. I had a friend who did PhD with me. Hmm. He was doing his postdoc at ETH Zurich, which is the top ten universities in the world. Oh. And then he applied for a job in US. Now, I, from what I gather, green card is a thing there that uh -huh. you need to be very highly qualified or you need to live for a very long time in the yeah. US to get the green card. Yeah. But they sponsored his green card before he even entered the US. They have a specific program for that. Yeah. I mean, if you are like a gifted person yeah. and they have a criteria for that, yeah. then everything is fast tracked. Yeah. I was supposed to do my postdoc at University of Oxford okay. and they sponsored my global talent visa. Okay. Which means that within few years I can get a citizenship there. Mm -hmm. I think the, the period was three years. Okay. And even after three years, if I'm, I'm unemployed, I can still stay there. Okay. So all these developed countries, they are developed. Yes. People will all will, will still move to them, like move towards them. They don't need to do it. But still they do it. Yeah. Because it's very hard to retain best of the talents. Yes. But in India we we do the opposite. Of, yeah, we kind of celebrate it. I, I don't know how, how it has happened. Mm. And uh, and you need to do this kind of very high high tech work, uh, like sem semiconductors or mm. AI or extremely good particle physics, let's mm. say, or extremely good science. You need highly talented, highly skilled people. Highly motivated people. Highly motivated. You need the right kind of equipment, the right kind of investment, yeah, yeah. the good, the right kind of atmosphere. Yeah. You know? can, can I put it in a more for, for, formal perspective? Yeah. So, in 1980s, hmm. uh, there is an economist, uh, Michael Kramer, hmm. who won the Nobel Prize with Esther Duflo and Abhijit Banerjee. Okay. Uh -huh. yeah. Just a show of point, my wife used to work with Esther Duflo, so she has worked with the Nobel laureate. Uh, so he, did, he, he gave this model, the O-ring model, hmm. it is called. What it means is that if you have n number of tasks, hmm. with n number of people doing that task, hmm. and the quality of each person is QI, okay. which means that if you have 10 people, hmm. Then Q1 to Q10. Yeah. And let's let's just say that the quality of one person is 0.99. That okay. one is perfect, mm. and the quality of one person is 0.99. Then your expected output is n multiplied by Q1 to Q10. Okay. So even if you have, if you do the maths, even if you have people with 0.99 talent, uh -huh. if you do it, the total output turns out to be some 90 or something. So even when you have 0.99 people, your your total expected value of the output it reduces the more people the lower the yeah quality. the more people even if you have talented yeah so you need extremely talented if you do it 0 0.9 if you reduce this 0 0.99 to 0 0.9 hmm. the total output goes to 30 wow okay 0 0.3 0 0.3 yeah yeah it goes to 0 0.3 which is which is crazy hmm. that even if you have like the creme de la creme like hmm. the 90 percent the talented people but it's still your output is low right. which means that you need to retain the point zero point nine 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 that kind of talent so that you can churn out the, the you can churn out the quality that can change the world mm. and that's what these developed countries do mm. so we have our IIT toppers we have our best PhDs going from India they all just move out they all move out yeah yeah so what can we do to I mean we know I mean it's it's no big secret that the quality of our education system isn't the best I mean the universities we know what sort of research or so-called research they churn out it's all about publishing papers in God knows what kind of journal so what can we do to improve this from an ac academic perspective one one <laughs> one uh, word answer money yeah there we, you need, we need huge amount of money if you yeah. see the kind of money uh, the developed nations even though they are developed the kind, the percentage of the GDP that they invest in their research, it's actually huge. And uh, we need we need money. We need money, and then we need to make sure that the quality of life that those people get here is actually it's very good. Yeah. Because these people they have n number of options outside. Mm. They can move wherever they want to move. Mm. If you want to, and if you see most of the people who are well trained outside, they have done work in very good labs or done extremely good PhDs outside, when mm. they come back to India, they come back to academia. Mm. Still, we don't have the company ecosystem, the industry ecosystem. Yeah. I have never heard that somebody has left Google and come came back to India to do work in a startup. Mm. There might be one or two here, there, mm. but I have never heard this chunk. Yeah, it's not a trend. Also. And, I, and I just explained with the O-ring model, you need a chunk of extremely highly talented people to churn out something good. Yes. One or two won't do. Mm. So, somehow we need to make sure, I am not sure how the entire thing will be done, but mm. money is the first thing we can begin with. Absolutely. Yeah. And people will say that we are not yet a first world nation, we are still a developing country, how would we, how will we invest so much money? I can give the example of China. From the 1990s onwards, they invested trillions of dollars of money into their education system, into building what 
this, this entire the thing that they have today. They have so many different programs. They have so many. They've identified universities that need to be the best in the world, and they've actually achieved that. It's it's cost them trillions of dollars, beginning from the 1990s onwards, when they were at the, on par with India. Yeah. So, yeah, it can be done. You need a national vision for that. You need great leadership for that. Hopefully, we have that now. I think we do have that now, but we are kind of beginning. We are kind of where China was in the 1990s. We are, we are going on, the, on, the, on that path now. So, I think it's going to take some time, but we are on the right track. So, what is the, what is the research that you're doing now? The IIT. So, I mean, as we, I recently joined, so I, hmm. will still, I still need to set up my lab. Hmm. Uh, but uh, I will do... I will do some something this that we were talking about the radiation heart thing mm -hmm. and the other thing that i used to work during my uh, during my belgium days belgian days mm -hmm. is to make these things work in a way that the light can go from point a to point b that it can never come back okay so it's what we call non reciprocal transmission for example i can see you you can see me okay so what should i do so that i can only see you but you won't be able to see ah, me okay yeah so it works everywhere. So if you can spy on your neighbor, if you can hear through him, him through the wall, he can also hear you through the wall. Mm -hmm. So what to do on this very small, at very at these at this very small scales, so that we can make light go from one place to other, but it can never come back. What's the application of this? So application first spying. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can use it to spy. Mm. But a more practical applications on the chip mm -hmm. is that when you have lasers, so because these lasers are very strong, mm. and when they go from when do you fire the laser from one side to the other side. Mm. Even smallest of the imperfection in your chip can cause these lasers to reflect back yeah. to with in inside the laser. Yes. That can destroy your laser. Yeah. yeah. So this this unit makes sure that it doesn't go back. Okay. Okay. Yeah. I see. Because it is non-reciprocal, it can let the laser go from this side to the other side. Okay. But not from the other other side to the to this side. So mm -hmm. this is these are the two major thrusts that I will focus. But of course, these things they evolve with time. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, new research interests always gradually come up and, and take precedence. Yeah, yeah. Right. And how is the teaching component in, in, in your work? I mean, you also have to teach, right? Le teach classes. Right, right now, I'm not teaching because, mm. again, I have just joined. Okay. But I think from the next semester, I will teach. Mm. And I will teach something related to silicon photonics. Mm. Because I think going forward, it is going to be a big thing. Mm -hmm. In academia, it was a big thing. Mm -hmm. And now in industry, it is going to be a big thing. Mm. So I think we need to train our students so that they can get good quality jobs in this field. Right. Yeah. If you had the opportunity, would you focus only on research or would you still want to teach some part of your time? I, I think I love teaching. You do? I think. I think so. Of course, I have never taught a full-blown course uh -huh. yet. I used to teach in, uh, I used to take like some, a module of some of the courses that my seniors used to float. Mm. But as such, I have, never, I have never taken a full-length course yet. Okay. So, um, I might be exaggerating that I love teaching. But I think I love teaching, so I would like I would like to teach as well, mm -hmm. and research. Of course, I would like to do my research as well. All right. Yeah. Well, very interesting talking to you. Thank you so much for a wonderful sure. conversation. Very enlightening, yeah. and all the best uh, for the research. Thank you so much, and thank you so much for having me on your podcast. My pleasure. Yeah. If you enjoyed this clip, the full conversation is available on YouTube, and the link is in the description below. Please go check it out.